Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Kerry Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Nikki Gumbel, welcome back to the podcast. It's so good to connect again. It's always lovely to be with you, Kerry. <laughs> it is, it is. And we look forward to in person again one year, perhaps yeah, 2023 lovely. at the uh, Leadership Conference uh, yes. at Royal Albert Hall. That will be amazing. So I would love to start this round of our conversation with a little more on your background. I've been curious for years and years and years, Nikki, um, educated at Eton, Cambridge, and Oxford, some of the very best schools in the UK, and you practiced law. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of the first part of your life before you experienced a call into ministry? Well, my father was uh, Jewish. He was um, uh, he was born in 1903, so um, he was quite he was 49 when he got married, and he had escaped really um, from Germany, um, where he, where many of his family died in the Holocaust. So um, he had lost, I imagine, although he never spoke to me about it, he'd lost many of his most of his friends and. A, 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 now I've discovered a, a great number of his family in the Holocaust. I, he never spoke to me about it. My mother, when I was 14, my mother took my sister and I for a walk and said, your father is German and Jewish, and you're never to speak to him about it. And we never did. Um, uh, and we never spoke to her about it either from that moment onwards. That was the last conversation. Um, and it was the only conversation, really. And so he he kept his life before he got married totally secret, really. It was a, it was. A, um, and now I think he probably didn't burden want to burden us with being Jewish. People were still very anti-Semitic, um, and and also I think he was traumatized um, looking back. And I don't think he died in 1981. It's only 36 years after the end of the war. I don't think that was time enough to recover. Many of the people who are telling their stories now um, waited until, you know, they were sort of 95 or whatever, um, 70 years after the war ended or whatever, to tell their stories. Because I think the trauma they went through was so unimaginable that they they never really recovered. So he came over here as a refugee. He had been, his family were very, um, you know, he was, I, I've discovered now, you know, he was obviously a friend of uh, Albert Einstein. He had, uh, his his family started, um, started um, uh, the Gumbel Bank, uh, which was confiscated by the Nazis. Um, uh, and so he'd come from a very privileged background, but he came here with nothing. And he started um, all over again, um, and my mother really had nothing that as well. And they, they, they invested everything in our education, um, and um, they, th we all our clothes were from secondhand shops. We bought damaged food from the um, uh, from the greengrocers, um, uh, but they invested everything in our education. So that's how I came to be. You know, sort of one off. He wasn't at Eton. Um, no, none of my family had ever been at Eton, uh, but they invested everything in sending me there, and um, and I was very blessed with the with um, a very sacrificial. They were a the sacrificial generation, the great generation. They sacrificed everything for their children, um, and I'm hugely grateful to them um, for what they did. But that's how I came to have a a very privileged um, upbringing. I'm rather moved by that. I, 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 I knew you had written about your father being Jewish and having fled the Holocaust. And, you know, I have two, both of my grandfathers escaped captivity from the Nazis as well, oh, not really? because they were Jewish, 
but because they were in occupied Holland. Okay. And my dad, who was born at the onset of the Second World War, still gets very emotional in talking about that. My, my grandfather was very much like your grandfather I, or your father. I had lots of questions, but we were never to speak of it. Yeah. How, how, how did that shape you as a child, knowing even the little bit you did at that time of your history and heritage? I don't know, Kerry. It's so difficult. I'm yeah. only just now learning about my family uh, in the last maybe few years. And the, how are you doing the, that? Um, just genealogical uh, well, research? Well, I, I was contacted by the um, Judaica Museum in Berlin, and they said where they were investigating uh, one of my cousins, and they asked me what I knew about my family. I said, I know nothing. Tell me what you know. And they sent me my family tree. Um, and I discovered, you know, my great grandfather was Moses. My great great grandfather was Abraham. Um, my great grandfather was Moses, not not the Moses or the Abraham, right, but right, right. not that old. But um, <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, and that then I discovered this bank, which um, where they in two thousand and nine they put up a statue to Abraham Gumble to recognise that that's where the bank had come from. Um, and um, they've named a street after one of my uncles who stayed to, he was the, like the mayor of the town, and he stayed to, um, his, he got his family out, but he stayed to look after the people. And he was arrested, tortured, uh, rearrested, and sent to Dachau, where, where he died in 1942. Uh, but they put up, a, you know, they've, they've named a street after him, um, one of my father's cousins. Um, another of my father's cousins was Emil Gumbel, who, if you if you study maths at university, you'll be taught about the Gumbel distribution, which is what he came up with. But he was he was he was a professor at the university, and they threw him out. And Einstein made a speech when they threw him out, saying, "This is you know th- it was his friend," um, and said, "You know this." And then Einstein helped him to escape to France, uh, where he uh, again taught at the university. And then when Hitler invaded invaded France, he he was a day ahead of Hitler. He Einstein again got him out and he went to America. So um so you know there I began to discover more I mean I've only discovered this. And now on Wikipedia I can go and I can Google my family and um I can find out a lot more about them. Uh, although most of it's still in German. So I haven't haven't understood all of it. But got to master um, another I language. I you know they're books um I've I um Recently got hold of, this is a book I've just got hold of, which is Emil Gumbel, Weimar German pacifist and professor. So, you know, I can, and this has got the Einstein speech at his, so I've been, and there are more and more books that are coming out, research that's being done. Because a lot of research was done in, um, about, uh, you know, Bonhoeffer, for example, and his resistance. Not much research has been done about the Jewish resistance. So, you know, this would have been part of the Jewish resistance to Hitler. Um, and um, and I think there's more people are getting more interested in now. More books are coming out, like the one I've just um, uh, got hold of. Um, and um, you can find out more about what was going on in the in the Jewish resistance movement. So this was prior know. to prior. This was be 1927, around then. You know that sort of time before, which is when my father came to England. He saw what was happening. He read Mein Kampf. I think I've discovered now that he read. Mein Kampf and realized what was happening and came over here and 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 qualified as a barrister in England, as well as he was already a lawyer in in Germany. But he he qualified as a barrister here and started practicing over in in England, where he met my mother, who was on the other side of a case to him. So my mother was also a barrister, and they your mother is English up. though. By my mother was English. my my birth. mother was yeah Scottish really, but but um Got it. she was she was she was uh, British. Um, and um, they got married late in life because the war had interrupted their lives. Um, and um, so, yeah, that was, that was my background. My goodness, Nikki, I had no idea uh, of all of those details. And thank you for sharing. I don't know whether you've read um, Walter Isaacson's biography of Einstein. It's absolutely delightful. But a surprising amount of it is actually dedicated to uh, his time in Germany, escaping the Nazis, coming to Princeton, and um, you know, you realize how shaping that was for an entire generation of Jewish academics and well, Jews. Period. But 
for Jewish academics as well, how, how precarious it was. I'm writing that down now. I'm going to get it. I'm going to order it as soon as I'm going to get a copy of it. As soon as I, um, we finish this, I'm going to make it's sure. It's a delightful I, I would, book, Nikki. I would and, love to read that. Mm -hmm. Um, that sounds absolutely fascinating. I mean, I've only really just discovered this link with, with Einstein. So I, but I'd like to know more about him now. I'll, I'll bet you would. Well, um, so let's let's pick up because uh, I feel like we could do a whole episode on what you're learning <laughs> about your family and Second World War Europe and and all of that. But Eaton, um, correct me if I'm wrong. A little knowledge is dangerous, but isn't that where the royal family is educated? And you know, yeah, Oxford, well, and Cambridge. Now, not not the, not the previous generation, but uh, Prince William and Prince Harry were educated there. Yeah, after, after yeah. my time. Yeah, <laughs> pre pre you. But those are those are very prestigious schools. And um, in, I'm always amazed at your mind. I'm amazed at the questions you ask, the way you write, the way you've led. How do you think your education at Eton, Cambridge, and Oxford prepared you to become, because you practiced law for a number of years. I mean, I was in it for a year. That was it. <laughs> that was as a student. So I don't want to overstate my, my time, but it was very shaping of me. You actually practiced for yeah. a number of years. How did that background shape you? Uh, the way you think, your mind, all of it. Well, I think, um, so I, I read law at Cambridge and theology at Oxford. Uh, I think law helped me to, um, I mean, in terms of faith, having come from a family of lawyers, my father, my mother, grandparents, and so on, I it meant that I was very interested in evidence. I think for me, it's important that our faith is based on evidence. Uh, it's not an irrational faith. It's not like a math. You can't prove Christianity mathematically or, or or scientifically, but there's evidence, more like historical evidence, uh, on which our faith is based. It's a rational. It's a reasonable step of faith. And that that I guess is very important from my sort of law background, um, and I guess. You, you have to sort of try and put your arguments into some kind of logical order um, before a judge or a jury. Um, so that was sort of training along those lines. And then theology really helped me. The three years studying, I did a law degree, uh, a theology degree at Oxford. And that was a huge challenge to my faith because most of the people who taught it wouldn't have necessarily called themselves, you know, Christian. Um, and uh, so it's hugely challenging. And I think that helped me because... Uh, the, the questions that I was asked while I was doing my theology degree were much harder than any question I've been asked in the last, you know, night, I'm now on our, we're on now on our 94th alpha small group in a row. And I've never been asked a question um, in those 94 that have been harder than the ones I was asked during my three years studying theology. That was the real test of faith. Um, every question basically was asked then. What would be an example of a question you got asked when you were studying theology? I think I think I hadn't realized, to put it very simply, I think Father Raniero Cantalamessa, now Cardinal Father Raniero Cantalamessa, has a very interesting chapter in a book he's written called Preach the Word about the human and the divine origin of the Bible. So, you know, we all know that that Jesus was a hundred percent divine and a hundred percent human, um, and that if you if you deny the full humanity of Jesus, that's heresy, or if you deny the full divinity of Jesus, that's heresy. But the same is true of the Bible, that the Bible is is a hundred percent human and a hundred percent divine, and I think we tend to. His point is that, that some people overemphasize the human side and therefore don't believe, don't actually realize that it's the word of God. It's 100% inspired by God. But I think probably when I started theology, I'd come into it from a background that emphasized the 100% divine side uh, and hadn't, hadn't, hadn't necessarily emphasized the 100% human side. You know, that there were, there, the, the dating of various books and how it had come together and the editorial process and that there's a very human side to how how this book came into existence and not to be frightened of that 
but that's okay. It can still be that and still be 100% the the word of God, um, uh, divine, divinely inspired. So I think, but when you start to look at the human side, it can shake your your um, your confidence in the divine side. And I think the it, it takes a bit of time to come for those two things to come together and realize there's a framework where you can you can understand and study all the the origins of you know, source criticism, all the stuff that you study, uh, how how the Gospels came into being, when they were written, where, how they, you know, all that stuff, and and uh, the, you know, the, the sources of the Pentateuch, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, without losing your faith in the divine inspiration and the power of uh, of the um, the Word of God. So I think it 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 helped me to to. It was it was very challenging to my faith, you know. I think I think mm. almost lost my faith at theological college, but it also, looking back on it, it probably dismantled it, and then I had to rebuild it around a, probably a, a bit of a more a more sturdy foundation. Well, I think anyone listening who's been to a mainline seminary, my experience was very similar. I was shocked to find that a lot of the professors didn't necessarily believe, or perhaps would not uh, be in any way labeled as Christians. And the education, mine was in the 90s, was very informed by sort of the German higher criticism and yeah. everything that descended from that. And you're right, it was a very, uh, I remember being quite angry in seminary and quite frustrated and quite confused. Now, your conversion, you did not grow up in a Christian home. Am I correct no. in that? No. So um, when did that happen for you chronologically? Uh, were you practicing law when you came to faith? Were you in undergrad, like reading, um, you know, law at, I guess it was Cambridge uh, at I the time? I was in my first year at Cambridge. I, at that stage, actually, I was reading economics. I switched to law after I became a Christian because I wanted to get on. I wanted to get on quickly with, I knew I'd have to be a barrister before I could do anything else. So, uh, <laughs> my, my, par- my father would not have tolerated any other profession. So, so I switched very quickly to law after I'd, um, and um, so the last two years, I, I did a law degree, a two, three-year law degree in two years. So I sort of crammed it in. Um, and then I did my bar exams and then I practiced uh, law uh, and, and originally tax chambers, which is what he wanted me to do. And then I did crime and then I did um, mixed common law. So I got a taste of everything, matrimonial, um, civil, commercial. I did a bit of everything. Um, which was a wonderful experience. And I loved it. I loved the bar. I loved, you know, I loved the whole, um, it, you know, if I was doing anything other than what I'm doing now, I'd love to go back to being a barrister. I, I've enjoyed it so much. I found it really hard to give up being a barrister because okay. I absolutely loved it. Well, and I, I want to talk about that, but let's talk about your conversion. So Cambridge, again, a very storied town. You don't necessarily come from a Christian background. Would you describe your previous worldview as atheist, agnostic, skeptic, uh, spiritual but not Christian? Like prior to that first year at Cambridge, what what would you have said your belief system I, I was, was? Atheist. I was atheist. a committed committed atheist. Okay. Uh, my father, my father was an agnostic, but I became an atheist um, in my teens. I I sort of. Um, uh, yeah, I just through through a kind of, I guess, sort of homemade philosophy. Um, uh, I became a logical determinist, um, and um, and was quite you know I sort of felt I'd found the answer to uh, the possibility of there being a god, and I became quite an argumentative atheist, which I was for the first my first term at. Cambridge, I there because there were there's quite a lot of Christian presence in Cambridge in those days, and quite a lot of attempts to convert the sort of um, freshers to the university, um, and I, I I did I felt I did a pretty good good job in in seeing them off and um, and um, um, pointing out the weaknesses in their in their arguments. Um, and do you know what drove your atheism? I th- I think I just it was a conclusion I'd come to. I wasn't really that um um I I don't know why I I I just looked at the world and thought 
you have no control over how you, the place into which you're born. You have no control in the body and brain that you're born with. That's predetermined. And therefore, your first action is predetermined. And your second action is predetermined by your brain, your environment, and your first action. So there is, you, there cannot be, a, you cannot, there can't be any sense of, of, of responsibility because you, you have no control over yourself. And therefore, the whole, you, everything is predetermined. And so you really were a determinist. Reward. Like that, that yeah, was a world. Yeah, a total determinist, absolute determinist. And I, did, and I felt that was, that meant there could not be, um, you know, it could not be a god, or the, all the idea of of sort of uh, moral right or wrong didn't really exist because everything was predetermined. Wow! So yeah, that's, and that's, that's that's a very popular worldview, um, especially among atheists. Yeah, and scientists, scientifically highly educated people. So, what happened in Cambridge, Year One? It, uh, well, my friends Nikki and Scylla Lee told me that they had become Christians. Um, and they'd been keeping it quiet that they'd been sort of investigating. I was I was very upset by that because um, uh, you know they was they were just lovely people, and I didn't think that Christians were. I thought Christians were weird and um, and irrational and everything else. So I was horrified. But I didn't really know. I mean, I knew a bit about Christianity, but I didn't. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to investigate. I'm going to find out about this and find out how I can deal with their, you know. What you, with how I can answer their their um, newfound faith, I can point it. So, literally that night, I started reading the New Testament. I happened to have this old Bible, which I'd had at school for sort of RE lessons, and I started reading it that night, and I was totally gripped by it. Um, and um, I read until about three in the morning, um, and then I I carried on reading the next day, and I. It, I, the only way I can say it, it, looking back, it was as if the person I was reading about emerged from the pages and I encountered him and I knew that it was real. I didn't want to become a Christian. I was still sort of fighting, um, but because I still didn't have an answer to my closed philosophical system. Um, but I think someone pointed uh, well, you know, if there really is a God, why can't he give, he, he sort of break into that system and give people free will? Um, and, you know, I, I, it's one of those things. I, there's so many areas I don't have any satisfactory answers to. I don't really, even whatever it is, 45 years, uh, more 47 years later, have any satisfactory answers to my original objections. It's just that I don't have any satisfactory answers to the question of suffering or um, there are a whole lot of areas um, in which you know, I become a bit like my father. I become more and more agnostic about a whole lot of areas um, that I just don't have the answers to. But, but at the same time, um, how, how God spoke to me in the first place, which was through the Bible, he continues to speak to me. And you sense that relationship and you have a, an assurance that it's real um, and that there's good evidence. You know, the I keep going back to the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And if Jesus really did, did rise, was raised from the dead, then that suggests there is a God and that, that God is to be seen through the lens of Jesus. God is like Jesus. Um, and that is, so, so that's on what, that's the, what I base my confidence in, plus the experience of that relationship over the last 47 years. Hmm. So, um, but it doesn't mean that you, people think that if you have doubts, that's it. But, but, um, but um, uh, faith and doubt are not opposite. As you know, they're two sides of the same coin. You cannot have faith without doubt. So the very fact that you have doubts means that that you that it is faith, because two plus two equals four. There is no doubt, but it doesn't require any faith to believe that two plus two equals four, because those are symbols we've invented. Um, that um, that is the case. But to believe that your wife loves you requires faith, because you can't prove it, but you can know it 
You can be sure of it, but you can't actually prove it um, scientifically or mathematically. And all the important things in life require faith because uh, are open to doubt, rather. And now there's nothing that's really important that isn't open to doubt. But the things that you can prove mathematically, they're important at one level, but they're not at the same level of importance as love, for example. And love is open to doubt. Wow, this is very, very rich. Um, I think what I want to talk about next is... Uh, did you do your your theology and law sequentially, or did you go practice and then go back to read theology? I did almost ten years of law altogether, if you can include yeah. sort of degree, bar, et cetera, et cetera, pupillage, um, and then I did three years of theology between nineteen eighty three and nineteen eighty six. I studied ah. theology at Oxford. So was it truly a second vocation, a second career? Yeah, it was. It was. Um, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a shift. So you loved law, no yeah. reason in the world to leave it. What was your call to ministry? How did that happen? I think I, I from the moment that I experienced a relationship with God through Jesus, the Holy Spirit, I just thought, why? You can't sit on this. You know, it's like um, this is um, there are all these people who don't know who are like me. Yeah, you know, I'm so thankful that somebody told me. Uh, I'm so thankful that for the Lees, because um, um, otherwise, I just can't imagine what life would have been like. But as I look back on my life before, I was searching. I was spiritually hungry. I was always looking, nothing satisfied. Everything left you with the feeling that there's something missing. Um, that, that You're always looking for the next thing, the next relationship, the next whatever it is. Um, and I wasn't, there was, a, there was an emptiness deep inside of me. There was a hole in my soul or whatever, or whatever expression you like to, to use, which was filled. Um, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and life in all its fullness. And the moment I experienced that, it was like, I've got to t tell people about this. And I was just surprised that people didn't immediately go, oh, last week you were an atheist. Now you're saying this. So I, 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 you know, I'll totally follow whatever you say. They were like, what? <laughs> so, uh, so not not everyone was was um, I mean one or two people yeah and a few of our friends I mean we we got a group of friends from that time who who found faith um, while while we were uh, there and um, many of them I've kept up with and are still some of my closest friends um, uh, but I had a desire to to tell people. And when I was practicing as a barrister, in my spare time, I was doing as much as I could to pass on the, the message. I was trying to, you know, we were running events. We were, um, as a lay person in the church, I was very involved in running groups and doing evangelism in, in every way that I that I could. Uh, often, um, looking back and thinking, totally cringed by what I did, you know, like knocking on doors, going out, doing surveys. First question is, where, what did you have for breakfast? Last question, would you like to ask Jesus into your life? It was like, <laughs> it was like you know, I was trying, um, but I was passionate about doing it. And I was torn between staying at the bar, which I loved, and what I'm do doing. I, I, and Sandy Miller helped me. said, you know, take a long-term view. Look at, look at, if you achieved everything you wanted to do as a barrister, as a lawyer, where would that lead you? Mm. And then look at if you did what the other, uh, where would that lead? You? And I looked at if I achieved all my ambitions, which I probably you become like a high court judge, a, a court of appeal, house, house, which I never would have done. But but the point is, if you look at it and you think, even if you got there, do you want it? And I didn't. So what's the point in climbing a ladder when it's leading against the wrong wall? You know, you're you're climbing up something and you don't want to get there when you get to the top. 
Whereas I looked at you know, if I was full time ministry, and I never thought I'd be doing what I'm doing now. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have hesitated for a second. But I thought I'd be like the the vicar of a church with maybe like a hundred people, one hundred and fifty people in it, and I I would be have the opportunity to pass to people and and tell them tell people the good news about Jesus. And I looked at one or two people who were sort of doing a bit more than that. They're sort of like were evangelists, and I thought I would love to be doing that. That would be absolutely mm. amazing. So I think that was. And there are other things. I'm just giving one thing, but there were, you know, there were passages in the Bible where I sense God speaking to me as we prayed, um, as we talked to our friends. Um, we we sense the call of God. So law is very academic, very logical. You came from not a faith background. Your faith background, once you became a Christian, was pretty much the Church of England, which is not known for, and I say this with affection, deep renewal <laughs> or evangelical well, fervor. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Long history, long history. But uh, the church was not seeing its best days. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. And so, you know, Anglican background, Church of England background, lawyer, very academic, you know, Ivy League schools. And then John Wimber shows up and the Holy Spirit visits your church profoundly, which, and that's been a very important part of Alpha, a very important part of your own story is the the charism, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah. charismatic part of your faith? I, I think we were so blessed by Sandy Miller. Sandy Sandy was, um, uh, we, I started going to, to HGB in 1976 I was actually born in, or, or, or my parents lived in the parish of, of Holy Trinity Brompton, but we never went there because they weren't churchgoers. Um, but when I left university, uh, I heard that Sandy Miller had come to be the like assistant pastor curate at, at HTB um, and that he'd been a barrister. Um, mm. So I uh, was looking for a church I never thought of going to HTB because it wasn't the kind of church that if you had a sort of very lively faith, you went to. Um, it was, there was no one under 50. Um, it was very traditional, robe choir. Um, so I went along uh, just to meet Sandy. Um, but then I heard him speak. Um, and um, uh, I mean, he, and I went up to him at the end of the service and he said, you know, Basically, he opened his diary. It was completely empty. He hadn't. There was nothing going on at all. He said, "Do you want to come to lunch? Stay for tea? Come to supper? Come back tomorrow?" And uh, and then he started a small group. Um, and actually, we're just hearing the story again this week because I was interviewing Justin and Caroline. But Caroline Welby, now married to Justin Welby, was the Archbishop of, the, of Camber, Canterbury. Yeah, for so people he, who may not know, yeah, she was in that first small group. She became oh, wow. a Christian. Um, in the first small group they had, this was way back in 76. And then um, Sandy asked Justin, um, who was a friend of his from Durham, to to look after Caroline when, um, uh, when that was, I, I, see, well, I, I can't remember how, how Sandy knew Justin. Anyway, he asked, he asked Justin to look after Caroline when she went to Cambridge, which he did. He looked after her extremely well. He married her. So, um, and that was, um, so, because, uh, yeah, anyway, that, so that, that little group started um, and it grew and grew and grew. Sandy's ministry was amazing. He introduced us all to the gifts of the spirit and to the ministry of the spirit. And then when John Wimber came, that, that was a, another, um, another amazing experience of, of, someone who prayed that prayer, come Holy Spirit, um, which of course is the most ancient prayer that is prayed every service in the Catholic church and, and in um, most of the historic churches. But he prayed it in a way I think we hadn't seen um, it, it with such an obvious expectation that when he prayed it, the Holy Spirit would come. And when he prayed it, the Holy Spirit did come and we saw healings and um the powerful experiences of God's love. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He gives you an experience of God's love. 
um, the Holy Spirit sends us out and calls us home. Uh, so he sends us out to, to tell others the good news, but he also calls us home to know that we are children of God, loved by the Father. Um, and it's those experiences of, were very powerful. And they were they had a big impact. And ever since then, that was uh, 1981 or 1982. So it's it's 40 years ago. Every service since then, we have prayed, come Holy Spirit. Um, and um, and that has had a huge impact. Every Alpha weekend, we pray, come Holy Spirit. And, um, uh, you know, we just had an Alpha weekend with our small group. So now we're doing Alpha back, on, back, back in person, but also uh, online. So last Saturday, we had our, our um, weekend. It's now an, an online. It's just a Saturday morning. But we prayed that prayer, come Holy Spirit. And in a few minutes, I'll find out more about how everybody got it got on because we'll go around and say, what happened to you on, on Saturday? What's happened to you since? And I know there'll be amazing stories of how the Holy Spirit um, transforms people's lives. And I think maybe the Holy Spirit had been slightly neglected in, in our theology. We talk a lot about God as Father, Jesus as Son, but the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, um, had been a little bit neglected. And I think Sandy um, really helped us to be more Trinitarian in that sense mm. and to, um, to, make, to invite the Holy Spirit every service, every Alpha weekend, and that has had a massive impact on on the church growing, planting, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's it's interesting because uh, you know I can imagine that non charismatics have an image of what might happen in a charismatic type service, and charismatics have another image of what might happen. But having had the opportunity to do Alpha in our context, but also. Uh, to travel to London, to go to Holy Trinity Brompton, to be at some events that you hosted, including weekend services. Uh, it's a beautiful fusion, I find, the way that you and uh, Alpha practice it between the intellectual and the spiritual. So it feels like, to me, uh, something that everybody could learn from. And I went back taking notes about you know, how it doesn't have to be this crazy, <laughs> almost out of control uh, moment that sometimes you see stereotyped or you see on, on one fringe or the rigid, intellectual, dry kind of thing that they're not mutually exclusive. What do you, and I mean, you will get to the Bible in one year, which I want to talk about because you tell story after story in the Bible in, in one year devotional about this, but just for those who may not be familiar with, when you pray that prayer, Come, Holy Spirit. What are the kinds of things that you would see? Like, what are you could tell a particular story, or like, well, here's here's generally what happens over the years when we pray that prayer. I mean, I think you you can't predict what the Holy Spirit is is going to do, and we always say the Holy Spirit has a a tailor made experience for you. The chief work of the Holy Spirit, as you know is so we know that God loves us because of the cross. The Son of God, Paul wrote, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. So if you ever doubt that God loves you, look at the cross. That's how we understand. But Paul prays uh, in Ephesians. He prays that we would not only understand the height, the depth, the length, the breadth of the love of God, but he also goes on to pray that we would know the love of God that surpasses knowledge um, uh, by being filled with all the films of God. So it's the Holy Spirit who gives us, it takes it from here to here. It gives us an experience. The love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, Romans 5, verse 5. So that's the primary thing we're praying for is that people will experience and know. The most important thing that you can know in life is that you're loved. That how do we deal with insecurity? Know that you're loved and know that you are loved. You're accepted for who you are. God loves you as you, you are. He doesn't necessarily want us not to change some of the things that we do and so on, but he, he loves us because he loves us. And that is the most life-changing experience. So that's fundamentally what, what we're praying for when we pray, come Holy Spirit, is that people would know 
that they're loved by God. And um, the Holy Spirit, of course, does different things. Sometimes uh, if you look at the, the, the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about, joy. So sometimes people just start laughing because they're so filled with joy. Um, some, very often it's peace. It's just like the sense, of, like a deep sense of peace. These are all the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, or self-control, you know, breaking, breaking habits that are addictions. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. They're things that happen. Sometimes it's physical healing. Sometimes it's, you know, I think it's quite often, um, I mean, in our last Alpha Small group, there was a young woman called Chloe. Her husband, um, actually, it wasn't the husband at the time, but her partner, um, uh, they've got engaged since doing Alpha, but her partner um, had no experience of faith at all. Um, but he, in, when we prayed, come Holy Spirit, he encountered God's love. And he was baptized at the end of the course. We had an amazing bat see him being baptized. And he's been telling everybody since. He's a lovely, lovely man. He, wor he works in the care profession with, with people with um, uh, learning, learning um, physical and learning di uh, disabilities. Uh, he's the most lovely, lovely man. But he, he'd never encountered Jesus before. He, she, Chloe, the, uh, his, his partner, now to be his wife, um, she'd had she'd been a trampolinist and she had a she had a she'd had a shoulder problem for six years she, her shoulder had been constant pain and it was healed on that moment on the weekend so different things happen and of course that was an amazing experience for her together with the fact that her partner um and so her faith came alive her partner became a christian um you know it's a, and this is Oh, I love what what I what what I do. I I enjoy being a barrister, but I I love this far far more because what what can compare with seeing that, um, mm. seeing people's lives transformed by Jesus through His Spirit, because it's the Spirit of Jesus that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. Um, so this is Jesus. This is how Jesus is at work today in the world through His Spirit. Jesus could only be in one place at one time. But his spirit can be with you and with me and with our Alpha group tonight and um, in Africa and Latin America and every other part of the world at the same time. And that's the amazing thing about the work of the spirit. You've already hinted at this a little bit, Nikki, but I'd love to pick up on you said, you know, as you've matured in your faith, you become a little agnostic of things or uh, doubt and faith go together. One of the things I think almost everybody struggles with spiritually is, uh, it's wonderful. And I, I would completely not question the healings that you're talking about, but I think it's no secret that not everybody get healed, gets healed, right? So yeah. you go to a Holy Spirit weekend, someone's shoulder is, is, is fixed and healed miraculously and stays healed for years. And then other people walk out on canes or in a wheelchair or, yeah. you know, weeks later die of cancer. How do you process that well i mean at, at one level it's it's like i don't know i don't know the answer yeah. to that um but it, the only thing i would say is is it it fits with jesus's teaching about the kingdom of god because hmm. as you know in the in the new testament uh the the expression kingdom of god or kingdom of heaven is 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 are 82 references to it in, in the New Testament. It's constantly Jesus was talking about the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom. But if you look at the references, as you know, um, uh, some of them refer to now and some of them refer to not yet. So, mm. so the, the kingdom of God, when Jesus came, the kingdom, he said, the kingdom of God is here, basically. Um, it's he Jesus had arrived. Uh, but, but then when he would also talk about when when the kingdom comes, uh, and we taught us to pray, your kingdom come, there's a future aspect to it. There's a present aspect and a future aspect. When God's kingdom comes in its, in its fullness, everyone will be healed. In one day, we will be with the Lord. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more crutches, no more wheelchairs, no more sickness. We will be with the Lord forever. 
right now there are signs of his kingdom. Jesus healed the sick. That that wasn't he didn't heal everybody in in Galilee or Jerusalem or in Israel at the time, but he healed some people, and that was a sign of the coming kingdom. So when Chloe's shoulder is healed, it's a sign. It's a foretaste of the future. But the but right now, not everyone will be healed. Why God chooses to heal Chloe's shoulder, but not so and so's cancer, which seems far more serious or whatever, I don't know. I just don't know the answer. Uh, but also, I'm just um, very convinced that that I know very little about anything. Yeah, my my. Um, funny enough, my. We have nine grandchildren. We have two of them living living in the house, a three-year-old, nearly four, and a one-year-old. And my four-year-old, three, nearly four, he'll be four on the, the 19th of December. He asked me this morning, why does God answer some prayers but not others? Hmm. So it's quite a difficult thing to explain to a three-year-old. So I said, you know your little sister, Aravis, who's one. You know when she goes to the dishwasher and tries to take out a knife you know why um your your mama says um won't let her take it um but she doesn't understand uh, and, I, and he said he said uh he said yeah but knives are sharp you hurt you can hurt yourself um um so he under so i said but but she doesn't understand that one day she will understand it and when doesn't God doesn't answer our prayers, we don't necessarily understand it. Um, uh, but one day, maybe we will understand. Maybe not in this life, but God may have a reason that we don't understand because Aravis doesn't understand why why mm. wh- why her mother won't let her play with a, a knife. But even Makar at three does understand that. So that was a very simplistic um, uh, analogy. But I mean, the fact is. I don't know, um, and and I know very little. That you know, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Uh, the older you get, the more you you realize how little we know about anything. Um, I remember um, I, in America one time, uh, we we were having lunch. I was sitting next to to an old lady in a wheelchair. Uh, she was late eighties, maybe early nineties, and there was a a very famous theologian um, at the at the table. And this this old lady kept asking me theological questions, and I kept pushing them to the theologian, who um, did his best to answer them. Um, um, but eventually, I said to her, "What what do you think?" And she quoted Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine. She said, "The secret things, the things that that have been revealed, belong to us." The secret things belong to God. The things that have been revealed belong to us. In other words, God has told us some things. We know that Jesus died for us. We know that Jesus was resurrected. We know there is a God. We know that God is love. We know there's certain things we know. But some things he's not revealed to us. Uh, in other words, she, she said she'd lived long enough to know that she didn't know the answers. And however much this theologian famous theologian attempted to answer them. You could see her thinking, he doesn't know the answer either, <laughs> any more than she did. Um, uh, although he gave very sophisticated sort of um, answers. They weren't satisfactory, actually, ultimately. Um, you know, there are some a lot of things we don't know. Uh, but we. You, I think, I, I don't know how this thing works. I'm the clue. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. don't know anything. Yeah. I can't understand how television works. I can't understand how this works. Um, but there is an explanation. It's just I don't know it. Um, and I just trust that there is an explanation for all these things. I don't know. So I'm going to try and stick with the things that I do know and that God has revealed to me, to us. So we're on the cusp of a new year. And uh, Craig Rochelle has called it the best devotional plan ever. I would agree. It's fantastic. The Bible in one year. Um <laughs> I would love to know, um, first of all, how you wrote it. So it has been uh, just a little bit of background, a practice of mine for over 20 years to try to read through the scriptures every single year. And I've done it most years uh, for the last 20, well, I guess it'd be almost 25 years. 
but I stumbled on your plan maybe five years ago and have really appreciated it. One of the questions a few of my friends knew that I was talking to you about this, they're like, ask him how he wrote it. There is so much there. Insight on every passage for 365 days, a story to to start it off, and then Pippa always adds something. Uh, How did you write this? So, uh, this is how it started. This is, this is how it started. That's how it started. Sandy Miller, who I mentioned already, my, my former boss, um, uh, the, the, the senior pastor, uh, I put in it the 1st of January, 19, uh, uh, the, first, the 1st of January, 1992. Um, so he gave me this, and, which is the Bible in one year. And I read it. So I've done that every year pretty much since the 1st of January, 1992, which is what, it's nearly 30 years. And in 2008, we had um, a, a guy who was actually a Palestinian um, um, who came in our small group. And after the end of the court, he was he's Catholic. Um, and he said, um, and I said, go back to your Catholic church. And, but he... He didn't really. He didn't really have it. I mean, he was. He was only a nominal believer. He'd been. He'd come to faith, um, but he, he wanted to start reading the Bible. So he said, "Can you help me?" So I said, "Well, I'll send you my thoughts from each day." Um, and so Pippa and I put our thoughts together for each day, and we sent them to him. And then we thought, well, we send them to the congregation. Um, and so, so we, we started, started doing that on the first of January two thousand and nine, and and then that year we thought of a theme for each day and then the following year i can't remember how it did but but i i i did two and a half hours a day on it every day two and a half hours a day every day oh, every day um so including christmas day um uh bank holidays sundays um uh two and a half hours a day on average i i, I worked on it for about f- five or six years and then i decided i've got to be more disciplined about this I'm, and I restricted myself and I have restricted myself to an hour a day ever since I still do an hour a day um, and um, and you know we've developed different things this year I'm doing an abbreviate uh, um, an express version of it so instead because ah. if you do the whole thing it's 25 minutes a day and that's yeah, a easy. long time and about 10 minutes of that is the Old Testament reading so the the express version only usually takes two or three verses from the Old Testament, the key two or three verses from the Old Testament and a shortened version of the of the New Testament and maybe half of the Psalm or Proverbs. Uh, so it's it's about more like 12 or 13 minutes each day. We've done a youth version of it. You know, we've done different things, verses for the day. Instagram, on Instagram, I put out the verse for the day and the thought mm-hmm. for the day and, of, yeah, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's just developed and we're going to do a youth, ver- yeah, yeah, we've done a youth version. We're going to do a children's version. You know, it's like, there's, there's so many ways you can, can, um, uh, one year I, I worked to get it to 50, exactly 1500 words every day. And it, that meant sometimes going from, you know, taking out one word or adding one word, but it got it to exactly 1500 words. So it's exactly the same every day in length. Um, you know, it's, we just did every year I've done a different thing on it. Um, uh, and try to develop it. And, you know, I love it. And I, because, you know, God spoke to me through the Bible. when I, That's how I became a Christian. And God still speaks to me through the Bible. Every day, there's this sense that there's something in the passage that is relevant um, and that is um, uh, will help me to, to deal with the issues you've got to deal with that day. And I think God responds to faith. And whatever you put your faith... So some people... They really believe God. Well, I think God speaks in a whole lot of different ways. But you, you, mm. you, you have you're likely to have a suit that your strongest suit. So for some people, it's worship. For Pippa, it's worship. You know, she really expects God to to experience the presence of God for God to speak to her in the worship, and He does. Uh, uh, for some people, it's 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 the sacraments. You know, they really expect that as they receive the body, the the bread and the wine, that they will encounter jesus and they do because they do it by faith it's faith god is responding to faith whatever you you put your faith in some people it's it's prayer and meditation for me it's all of those things but the primary way in which i experience 
the presence of, of God and the voice of God is through reading the Bible. I find that there's something in it each day that I go, that's relevant. You know, that I understand something. That's that's what, you know, that helps me to deal with this situation. Um, so to me, it's 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 um it's it's like it is as the psalmist says, sweeter than honey. It's like spiritual food. I I can't survive without it. Uh, you know, I can't any more than I can't survive without breakfast. I can't survive without food, spiritual food. I'm very similarly wired in that scripture is the primary way I feel like I hear from God, um, which is which is incredible. So it is new. Having been on the plan for, I don't know, five, six years or so, there are parts I, I recognize. And then there are others. It's like, I don't think I've read this before. So it's refreshed every year. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I, every year I'm trying to, to, um, yeah, to, to update it, improve it. Um, uh, you know, and people write in and they make good points. They say, uh, hang on, have you considered this? Or I don't agree with what you're saying there uh, because of this. And I will go, okay, well, I need to change that. Um, and, you know, I don't always agree with everything that's, that's said, but very often they've got a good point. And so I'll, I'll try to the following year, try to, to put it right. Um, or, you know, you've missed this or you've missed that, or why haven't you done this? So I, I, I'm taking the feedback all the time. And then now, because there are quite a few people who do it, so there's quite a lot of feedback. So, um, well, and uh, and you're very humble to do that. I would say, Nikki, that that shows incredible humility. So, uh, it will be available on U version again for 2022 and beyond. Are there other places people can get uh, the Bible in one? Well, there's there's, a, there's an app on the phone. You just get um, the Bible in one year. Is a um, it looks like. Um, Oh, it's a separate app now too. I get it's, it always through you. Yeah, yeah, for a long time. Um, so the, this one, the app, if you do the app, which it looks like a little um, thing like that, B-I-O-Y, yeah. it's free, okay. free to get. That you get the up-to-date version. If you do ah, you version, you, you get, so what will go on you version is the, on the 1st of January, 2022, you will get the whole of 2021. Ah, if you go you. to the app, you'll get what I did, um, just I've just re-recorded for this year, so I'm re-recording. Yes, and you do the every- audio, don't you? You do the. I do audio. the audio. I just I'm doing the express audio this year every morning. Yeah, I do it. it takes me about 15 minutes to just uh, do the audio um, each day. Um, for the for the longer version, David Suchet does the reading, but for the express version, I just do the reading because it's quite short. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I love it. I I. It feeds my soul. That's all. It, if it doesn't feed anybody else, it feeds my soul doing it. Um, I'm preaching to myself. And so many people have been involved in helping me. You know, all these this feedback I've had. I, I Quite often, I, I don't, I read and I think, oh, I wonder where that came from. Um, <laughs> so, because um, um, well, so many people have fed into it. So, so uh, anyway, I, 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 my favorite bit, as everybody's favorite bit, is the Pippa ads. Um, and if I had a, if I had a, a dollar for everyone who said I I don't read your bit I go straight to the bit for ads I'd be a rich man. <laughs> I know you got an alpha to get to, and the sign of a good interview is most of my questions didn't get touched. So we may have to do a round three at some point, Nikki. That would be a delight, and perhaps in person next time. But yeah. U version has because we're recording this on the day that U version hit half a billion installs, yes. which is. Amazing. Insane, and I, I know that's something that you're very committed to. You've been a huge version. So, you version for those of you who may not have discovered it is a free Bible app that Bobby Grunwald and the good folks at Life Church have developed. And he and Craig Grishel have been behind it. And I've been a huge supporter as much as I can in my little world of you version. And it's getting the Bible onto literally half a billion phones around the world, which is incredible for free because generous yeah. donors make it possible. Um, any thoughts on on the impact of that? And then you're also involved in the 2033 project, are you not? Yeah. Well, I, I, Bobby Grunwald, who's a member of the Alpha International Board, um, I think is an amazing guy, such a humble guy. And he started in 2008. And as you say, it's now passed half a billion um, downloads, installs. Uh, it's in over 2,000 languages. Um, and it, sorry, 2,000 uh, different translations, 1,374 uh, languages. 
Um, and I think it's a remarkable achievement. And yes, 2033, uh, at the the big date in my diaries, I'm sure, as in yours, Kerry, is the 17th of April, uh, 2033, uh, which is 2,000 years since the resurrection of Jesus. Mm. And it's two, 2033 is 2,000 years since the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, 2,000 years since the death and resur resurrection of Jesus, and 2,000 years since Pentecost. And um, I love what Rick Warren talks about, finish the task, FTT. Um, Jesus gave us this task. Why don't we try and finish it by 2033? Let's make a go, have a go at it. <laughs> we all work together. The Bible translators are doing phenomenally. 99.9% .9 of the of the world will have the New Testament in their own language by 2033, and all the rest will have 25 chapters of the New Testament in their own language. Um, why not try? Let's try and get make the gospel available to everyone on the planet. You version will be part of that. I hope they'll go from 500 million to 7 billion downloads by 2033. As far as Alpha's concerned is we'd like, you know, we're doing a new film series. Um, uh, we're hoping that that we will, uh, uh, you know, it, already the film series is in, in, I don't know how many languages, but we're trying to make Alpha available to everyone on the planet. Um, there will be many other ways, of course, um, the chosen. I'm doing something with um, uh, the the, uh, the the man who plays Jesus in the Chosen tomorrow. We're doing some filming oh, wow. together, and that I think is you know another amazing project, another wonderful way. It's a bit like the the Jesus film. It's a way to get the the gospel out to people, the good news in a in a, in a modern contemporary way out to people across the world. Uh, and um, you know, Cardinal Tagle is doing a phenomenal job in the Catholic Church with. Uh, as head of the uh, Pontifical Council for Evangelization. I'm hoping that we've invited him to the conference in 2023. He's already been, you probably heard him speak at, at the leadership conference before. But so it did involve the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the all the different churches and all the different initiatives. But if we do it together, uh, there'd be synergy. And why couldn't we get the good news out uh, to the whole world, to the whole planet, as Jesus told us to do, uh, by the 2000th anniversary of his death and resurrection. That's the vision. Nikki, I got to tell you, every time we talk, I just get so energized by you. And I have been keeping questions. I don't do this for everybody, but I've been keeping questions to ask you for years now. So I've got, uh, oh, about another dozen that we didn't get to today. But uh, <laughs> perhaps we will do that in the future. And any Love final to. thought or challenge? I think this interview to me, what really makes it fascinating for me is... You know, we often get to know people like yourself after there has been some level of, you know, being known for what you've done. But the origin story is infinitely fascinating to me. And it's always uh, more complicated. There's always a little more pain than any of us would have imagined. And there's also not a lot of certainty about it. There's not an inevitability that you would have ended up doing what you're doing with your life. But, you know, one of my favorite metaphors is, I think Eugene Peterson took this from Kierkegaard, but the long obedience in the same direction. Yeah. Right. Which I think gets undersold. We live in an age of flash and, oh, I want to grow, yeah. you know, 100% a year for, you know, five years. And it's like, well, it doesn't always work that way, does it, Nikki? <laughs> no. 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 Any final word? Job. Well, I, I, Kara, I think you've done a great job with the, the podcast. I uh, um, over the last you know two years, particularly, I think that the podcasts have provided a source of inspiration to to hundreds of thousands of people across the world. I, I think, as I've said to you, I've written to you. I think I think you're a very very good interviewer. It's a great skill to interview, and you have to be interested in other people and genuinely interested. And that's what comes across when you're asking questions that you are genuinely interested. It's not a, uh, and that's a huge skill. And uh, all the best interviewers in the secular world have that skill. And um, so I'm not surprised that the podcast has been downloaded millions of times because God has given you an amazing gift of being able to, uh, the verse, it, it's a bit like Alpha. Um, the verse th that I often quote on uh, Alpha is, uh, train, uh, training the team on Alpha is that, there's a the verse in Proverbs which says, the heart of a human being is like a deep well. The wise person draws it out. And I think it, that skill, I always say to our, to, 
to our um, hosts and helpers, no one is boring because it says in Proverbs, the heart of every human being is a deep well. And if you find someone boring, that's that's your fault because you, it's our fault if we find that because everyone's interesting if you can draw it out of them. And that skill, you have an amazing um, ability, Kerry, to draw out from every person that you interview things, the deep well that is in every human heart and draw out things that will interest people, inspire them and help them. So um, uh, congratulations on what you're doing and keep doing it because it's a great blessing to the, oh, to the world. That means an awful lot to me, Nikki. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Any final word or challenge for leaders? I mean, you've hung in there. I see the joy in your face. I see the enthusiasm at a time, you know, in a stage of life where a lot of leaders would dial back and go put their feet up and do something else with their life. I see you, you know, you got to head out the door in minutes to go to your next alpha, which I absolutely <laughs> love. Any final word to leaders as we're on the cusp of a brand new year, Nikki, no, to encourage them? No, I think it's them? been a very tough time for leaders. I think the the mental health challenges have been absolutely huge in the last 18 months. I, I know very few people who haven't struggled in some ways with mental health issues in the last 18 months. And uh, we've been through a storm. Um, and Jesus said, when a storm comes, some houses that are built on sand are going to get blown away. But the houses that stand on the rock will stand. And I think... Uh, you know, the fact that you're still standing shows your house is built on a rock. <laughs> Trying to. Every person is listening to this. You wouldn't be listening to this unless your house was built on a rock because you'd be off doing something else. Um, <laughs> but if you're listening to this, that's the evidence that you built your house on a rock and you the storm has come and you're still standing. And so I'd say just keep going. Keep just putting one foot in front of another. Sometimes life is like that. You just have to put one foot in front of another and keep going, even though life is tough. Life is difficult. And that's Scott Peck's op opening line of his, his book is, is, life is difficult. You know, life is not easy. There are just, everybody's, uh, whether it's Plato or not, I don't know, but the, be kind because everyone out there is fighting a hard battle. And um, if you're listening to this, I have no doubt You've been through a hard battle, but you're still standing. So you've built your house on a rock. Keep going and God bless. That's a fantastic word. Uh, Nikki, quick website or a place where people can connect with you and all that you do online? Um, well, I, you know, I do all these uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I have a little one here. We'll know, link to HB everything website, in the show. Alpha website. I don't know. They're, I'm hopeless at these There's things. There's a lot. They're, they're quite, they're, they're, there are various things that where where yeah, there's stuff around. All right. Well, alpha. that's fantastic. If you've never done alpha, I'd encourage you to to do alpha because I think every in my experience, um, and I've done ninety four of these courses in a row. Every everybody, practically everybody, gains something. If you and if you've never done alpha before, I'd encourage you to 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 explore. It's a wonderful way to explore faith, to deepen faith, to experience the Holy Spirit, to grow in your faith. Um, that's one one thing that is worth worth exploring. I would second that, Nikki. Thank you so much. You've been so generous with your time and no, with your so wisdom. Lovely to be with you. Thank you. So thank appreciate you. you. Thank you. And Nikki. I always enjoy talking to you, Carrie. Thank you so much. God bless. Much love. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.